Welcome again. Uh, hope everybody gets to get on with me quickly. This is Mike with Open Heaven Inspiration and um, had a little bit of technical difficulties today, but uh, we're back online. Um, I, I said that we're going to have some special guests and that may not happen. So um, here with Open Heaven Inspiration and today, um, just a few moments ago, and I just want to say this again quickly for those who are getting on. Again, a special shout out to the mothers. God bless the mothers. Where would we be without you? Um, so if you, if you have a special admiration for your mother, let's send up a few hearts on the screen right now. Okay, so um, today we're going to be talking about, um, about how God can get the glory out of our greatest weaknesses and okay, and we get some hearts going up there, so we're all engaging. Uh, love you guys. Uh, today, we're going to talk about how God can get the glory out of our greatest weaknesses and our worst failures. And I do want to say hello to Sam Cook, to Angela, and to Bonnie. Thank you for joining me. And uh, Wayne Allen is watching as well. Uh, Wayne's from uh, Shannon54. But um, anyway... Um, so to get into this, uh, to get in this discussion today, I want to kind of take us back a few years uh, to let you know when the Lord first put this, uh, put this whole concept on my heart. I had a dog that had a heart condition, and the uh, the vet was baffled. He didn't know how to help her, so he ended up sending me uh, to a veterinary cardiologist who was out of town. And the whole thing was kind of a challenging, uh, a challenging ordeal. Um, and you know, I would pray for my pet and and uh, do all the things that were necessary. But I remember one day I heard the Holy Spirit say, "Special people have special problems," and uh, so that's kind of what stirred this in my spirit today. And and Lord knows, um, with the pandemic that's going on. Um, I think we've all got a few challenges, if we be honest. So um, when I said at the beginning that God can get the glory out of our greatest weaknesses and our worst failures, I want to break that down just a little bit, because I know that we probably have folks uh, tuning in today from all different levels in their faith. Um, but essentially what that means is that when God gets his glory, it means his greatness, um, his power, his mercy, his wisdom um, are seen in a dramatic way. So what I'm going to do uh, over the next few minutes to, just to kind of unpack this is to talk about some biblical characters. And one of the things that we had a lot of fun with last week is, is some of the comments that came in. So if you have any thoughts, any, any uh, great insights, feel free to share them, and I'll share it with everybody else. So the first person that I want to talk about here is a man that is mentioned in a couple of Gospels. He was a man that was born blind. He was 40 years old, uh, blind from birth, and he had an encounter with Jesus. At the beginning of the passage in the scripture, um, Jesus and the disciples were together and they happened to notice this man who was born blind. And uh, according to the scripture, um, the, the disciples asked Jesus if he was blind because of his own sins or because of his parents' sins. But Jesus' response was that, it's, that it was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, but it was because it was so that the power of God could be seen in him. And so a couple of things I want to take out of this passage is that uh, there, there is a, there's quite a bit of interactions with this man before his healing and after his healing. But the scripture never tells us his name. Uh, all we know is that he was labeled at the beginning of the story as the man who was born blind. But after an encounter with Jesus, he was known as the man who used to be blind. 
No, another person I'd like to talk about, and we're just going to kind of go through some of these and then just wrap it up, uh, wrap it all up into, into something that will minister to us and it will encourage us. Um, but there's another person uh, in the Gospels, that's called, he's the man called Legion. And, and in, in case you're interested in the passages about the man born blind, it was uh, John chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. The man called Legion, um, the, the passage that I'm taking this from is Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20. And it says, Then came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him a man out of a tombs with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains." because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. And always night and day, in the mountains and the tombs, he was crying and cutting himself. And so once again, we have another character in the scripture that we don't hear his name, but he is labeled by a weakness or a challenge that was so great that that's, that, that was who he was. At least that's the way he was referred to. And so when he had an encounter with Jesus, uh, Jesus, uh, in this situation, this was a person that was troubled because of an unclean spirit or a, a stronghold of unclean spirits. So when Jesus asked him what his name was, he said, my name is Legion. And um, what's significant about this passage is that uh, the, when he said, he said that my name is Legion, this was the, this stronghold of demonic spirits that was troubling him. We know that a legion was 6,000 Romans, but we also know that from history that every legion had a name. So he was saying um, the, the name of this legion is that we are many. And, and the way this applies to us is sometimes, you know, if we look in the mirror, if we, you know, get down the valley or wherever we are, um, sometimes it can seem like you don't, like we don't just have one challenge, um, that we have a lot of challenges. So, so the man called Legion is kind of like someone, um, just for sake of example, who goes, who would to go to a, a counselor or a psychologist and, you know, sit down in the leather chair and, 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 and if he asked him, what did you come for me to help you with? He'd be saying, he or she would be saying, where do I begin? So, um, but he had an encounter with Jesus and, and, and Jesus uh, broke down these strongholds in his life and he came to his right mind. Now, um, the great thing about his story is that after this encounter, he wanted to uh, get on the boat with Jesus and travel with him, but Jesus had a different and a better assignment for him. And by the way, there is Don John from, from Istanbul, Turkey. What an honor to have you with us today. Um, but uh, So he departed, and, and the scripture says in verse 20 that he departed and began to proclaim to the Decapolis all that Jesus had done and all were marveled and all were amazed. The capitalist was a region, uh, depending on the time of history, that had between 10 and 15 cities. So he went to a large region and he became an evangelist um, who amazed people with the testimony of what God had done in his life. Uh, the next part, the next uh, story that I would like to share with you is, um, is a story from the children of Israel. Exodus, actually, I want to say something else. So, um, so he had a testimony that, uh, that amazed the people and, um, and, and what, this is what I want to say about the power of a testimony. Um, and and uh, is that in, in Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, it says that the testimony of Jesus 
is the spirit of prophecy. And so there's something about when it, it, the prophecy uh, is something that doesn't just foretell the future, but it actually sets things in motion. And so um, a testimony, anytime you tell a testimony about something that God has done in your life, it has pro prophetic power to set the same good thing that happened to you in motion, to set that in motion so that that great thing can happen in the lives of others. So many blessings uh, for this man called Legion, who again, didn't know where to begin when it came to talking about all of his challenges. Um, the next uh, group of people I would like to talk about are the children of Israel. And um, in Exodus 1, chapter 1, verses 9, uh, we're, we're told the story uh, about the children of Israel who had, they had moved into that country during a time of famine, and, and Joseph, who was one of the sons of Jacob, had found great favor with the Pharaoh. But after that Pharaoh passed away, a new Pharaoh came in uh, that they did not have the favor with. And, and, uh, and so in this passage, in chapter 1, verse 9, he, he said, Look, the people, the children of Israel, are more, and they are mightier than we. And he said, Come, let us deal shrewdly with them. I wanted to highlight that scripture. And, uh, and, uh, and good to see you here today. Um, I wanted to highlight that scripture is that they saw that they were more and they were mightier. So they decided to oppress them. They wanted to keep them in Egypt and they wanted to use them for labor. And so they set out these plans to afflict them with burdens to keep them under control. And it says that they built um, for Pharaoh supply cities, but the more they afflicted them, the more that they multiplied and grew, and they were in dread of the children of Israel. And so the reason I'm sharing this scripture is because um, there could, you know, it's natural for us when we have challenges, when we have problems, um, it can affect our self-identity. It can make us think less of ourselves. But the, but the reason I'm talking about this story, the key here is that they weren't going through this challenge because they were weak. They weren't going through this challenge um, because they were not great. They were going through this challenge because their enemy saw their greatness, saw their might, and wanted to keep that under check. And so I want to park here just for a minute. For those of you that are listening, who have major challenges in your life, it's not because you are less of a person, that you are less of a Christian, you are less of a citizen in your society. It could just be because we all, we all have an enemy who does not like us. And, and uh, you know, I, I, and one of the expressions I like to live by is that uh, nobody loves you like Jesus, but nobody hates you like the devil. And so we all, you know, sometimes we have people who don't like us and we get, and we can get confused and we can put our animosity towards that person and forget that our real enemy is not that person. Our real enemy is Satan because he hates the, the children of God, the uh, uh, men and women that are walking on this earth that are made in his image. Whether you call yourself a follower of Christ or not, um, the devil is not your friend. God is your friend and he wants to know you intimately, but the devil, just to, for lack of better words, he hates your guts. I don't know why I threw that in there. That was for free. Um, but um, moving right along, I'd like to share um, about another person here. 
And, um, and this person is, is Paul. Uh, we're all, most of us are familiar with him because he wrote two thirds of the New Testament. But Paul had some challenges. Um, we know that in Paul's early days, he was a very well-respected Jewish person who kept the law. And when Jesus came on the scene and, and be, people began to follow him, and by the way, Mike Smith, thank you for joining us. When they began to follow him, um, there, was, uh, there was a lot of dissension with the Jewish people about this. And, and, and Paul, in his zealousness for the old way, so to speak, and because of his misunderstanding of what God was doing through, through Christ and his followers, he began to persecute and he began to uh, throw people in jail and he was even instrumental in, in deaths of some very prominent uh, Christian leaders. So, um, so Paul's an interesting person that we can get perspective from because Paul was actually admired by some people. But yet, as we get into this scripture, we'll see that, that you know, obviously Paul, Paul had some challenges. So in the midst of this persecution, Paul had an encounter with Christ on the road to Damascus. So Damascus was a, another a prominent city. He was heading there to, uh, to throw people in jail and to persecute them for following Christ. And in Acts chapter 22, verses 6 through 12, it says, Now it happened as I journeyed and came near, and I as it journeyed and came near Damascus at about noon, suddenly a great light from heaven shone around me, and I fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So I answered, who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, who you are persecuting. What a, what a shocking turn of events. Paul was persecuting, um, literally having people killed. He thought that he was doing it for God. But when he had a, a face-to-face or a real-life encounter with Jesus, who was part of the Godhead, he, and, and God called his name, he said, who are you? He didn't know God. So Paul is an example of a person, a misguided person who made a lot of mistakes. If any of you can relate to making some mistakes, why don't you go ahead and smash that like button just so that we know that we're among friends, amen? If I had a like button to, to smash uh, on, this, uh, on this Facebook Live broadcast, I would go ahead and smash mine. And Keith Fitzpatrick just joined. Thank you, Keith. Um, so, so this was Paul's. This was Paul's issue. This was his challenge. He had been misguided. He had made uh, critical mistakes. And, but in Galatians chapter one, uh, verses 22 through 24, we find out how God was able to show his greatness, his love, his mercy, and his power through these terrible mistakes that, that Paul had made. So it says, he shares, he says, and I was unknown by face to the churches of Judea. So they hadn't seen him on Facebook yet, which were in Christ. But they were, but they were hearing only this one thing. He who formerly persecuted us now, he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy. And they glorified God because of me. And so isn't that amazing? God took this dark past that David had. And, and after an encounter with God, when he began a relationship with God, people 
gave glory to God and they saw his greatness and his power because of the transformation that had taken place in his life. Now, as we're talking about Paul, it's good to talk about something else in his life. Paul experienced something that he called a thorn in the flesh, which in our modern day times, it would be something that's excruciating and painful. It could be something like the man born blind that had a physical problem. It could be something like the man called Legion who had perhaps mental, emotional, personality problems. Um, it could, could, could relate to many things. But Paul had a thorn in the flesh later in his Christian life. And he cried out to God to take that away. And, and, and what's beautiful about the way the scripture paints that is that it doesn't specifically tell us what it was. So we can take what I'm about to share and we can apply it to whatever our challenge is. So when he prayed to God three times, the Lord responded and he said, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now this is, now we could just stop there. And that's just a huge gold nugget for all of us. Um, but, but Paul being the, the extremist, he was an extremist before he, before he had that encounter with God and began to serve him. But he didn't stop being an extremist. And we know this because of what he shares the rest of the verses. He says, therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, I am strong. So again, here's Paul the, Paul the extremist. What Paul was saying here is that because of this challenge that was continually before him, he realized that it, that it had caused him to focus on God, that it caused him to rise up in, in strength. And it was almost as if he was saying, um, it was almost as if Paul was saying that, that that challenge had taken him to a place in God where he wouldn't trade it for anything. And, and I think we all have modern examples now uh, of people that we see that even say the same things. Um, you know, there's the, uh, there's the evangelist, I believe his name is uh, uh, Wojcicz, who has no arms and no legs. Become a, started off, with, you know, born that way, uh, a young troubled man who contemplated to suicide at the, at the age of 10. But now... He's won hundreds of thousands of people to Christ and God has done miracles and, and uh, he has, God has done miracles through him and he's spoken to state leaders. And if you hear his messages, he believes in healing. He believes in miracles. Um, but, he, but he says, you know, but he says that this, this challenge, this physical challenge he has talks about how it's worked for good, not just for him, but for people who are all over the world. Now, before I get into our next, uh, well, I'm gonna go ahead and, sh and share this. Um, before I get into our next thing, uh, what you're about to enjoy is the spontaneity of Facebook Live. Um, I, um, I do not have a timekeeping device with me at this moment. So I'm going to disappear from the screen and I'm going to be right back. And in the meantime, if anybody would like to share any comments, um, that would be great um, because we can jump on that when we get into our discussion.
Okay, thank you everybody so much. Thank you everybody so much for staying on the line. Um, so um, it looks like we're just about at the end of 30 minutes. And so um, I really like to keep to the end of 30, uh, to the end of 30 minutes. Um, I have really uh, a lot more to share. Um, so uh, thank you for your grace in this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna share something. I'm gonna try to pack something in just for two minutes so I can, so I can uh, kind of uh, fulfill this, the, the mission of this message and so I can also uh, respect your time. I want to finish this off um, with one last story. And this is, about, this is about the biggest mistake in the history of the world. And that was the mistake that was made by Adam and Eve in the garden. We know that after they ate, ate of the tree, of good and evil. We, before it, there was no death, no abuse, no destruction, no disease. But after they committed that, everything changed. Biggest mistake in the history of mankind. But God got the glory. He sent his son Jesus and he redeemed us. From, he brought, brought us redemption from death, hell, and destruction. So this is how I say God got the glory. Would we have ever known about the mercy of God if there had not been sin? Would we have never known the greatness of his healing and his love if we had not had an infirmity or not had some kind of challenge going on around us? So even that, God, God got the glory. So just to kind of wrap this up, um, I'm not seeing any, any comments, and that's, that's perfectly fine. Um, if you want to throw something in, I'll share it. But, um, but uh, what I want to say here is that, um, is that God can get the glory out of anything, no matter what you've done, no matter what is maybe wrong with you, you were born with. God can get the glory out of it. Do I believe in healing, physical healing, uh, emotional, mental healing? Yes. Do I believe in breakthroughs and turnarounds? Yes, but we can have joy in the journey as we are on our way to God's answer and to his relief. And so um, I want to thank everybody uh, for joining me today. Uh, once again, today we had planned to have Wayne uh, from Shannon 54 in South Africa, uh, in South uh, Cape Town, South Africa. We had planned to have him join us, so we're going to work on some technical things. Um, this is a partnership that God put on my heart for our ministry. And I know that we, you know, this is a challenge in Africa, and some of us might think, well, we've got uh, enough challenges here in the U.S., but love knows no distance and love knows no bounds. So until next week, next Sunday at four o'clock, I love you all with the love of the Lord. Be encouraged and I'll see you then.